Uh, I wish you a good afternoon. Uh, many thanks for joining us at this online event of the uh, launch of the Science Research and Innovation uh, Report uh, of the EU. It's the 2022 uh, edition. My name is Eric Anton. Uh, I'm the Deputy Chief Economist in DG Research and Innovation. Uh, I now would like to give the floor to uh, our Director General Jean-Éric Paquette for his introduction. Eric, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you at the launch of our Science Research and Innovation Performance uh, Report. I'm sure you will find um, uh, the report uh, inspiring and uh, no doubt useful also uh, for the work you are doing um, uh, with us uh, here in Europe, but uh, possibly also work which you do beyond Europe, as I think that a lot of the analysis which was brought together by more than 100 colleagues uh, in the European Commission and outside, uh, gives uh, a strong um, a sense of why uh, the world should continue to invest more and better in uh, research and innovation. The backdrop is that we are going through uh, very testing times uh, in Europe uh, and worldwide. Of course, uh, we have this war of aggression of uh, Russia against Ukraine with all its atrocities. Uh, but also deep um, geopolitical, economic, uh, social, food safety uh, related uh, consequences. Europe has just been through uh, a deep uh, pandemic um, uh, alongside uh, the world. And all that is, of course, a crisis which needs to be looked and managed uh, against the need for deep transformations in Europe. We are an aging society. Uh, a continent which needs to look at its competitiveness and producti productivity. There's still investments to be done to overcome digital divides. But more important than all of that is, of course, also the need to lead on uh, policies to fight uh, climate change and uh, biodiversity loss. So Europe is uh, actively investing in its transformations and uh, doing that um, against uh, these uh, a crisis um, and, and others which uh, no doubt will continue to test us. So wicked problems, uh, challenging political, economic, uh, social uh, circumstances requires knowledge and uh, systemic solutions. And uh, it is really only research and innovation uh, which can provide uh, that knowledge and these uh, systemic solutions. So we are deploying in Europe and um, I hope we we can uh, inspire at the European level also increased investment across individual member states. We are investing in research in this uh, triangle of uh, uh, transformations, uh, crisis, uh, but also the need to, to look at uh, sovereignty, technological sovereignty to begin with, which is really what we also will need as we move uh, into these very uncertain geopolitical times. This requires a good investment, and good investment needs good data to make the right choices. As I said um, at the outset, uh, I am much impressed by the work done uh, by many, many teams in the European Commission and with partners in OECD and beyond over the last months. The Science Research and Innovation Performance Report 2022 is really of uh, the highest quality. It gives a strong sense of perspective and direction for research and innovation investments. The data is all available. It has inspired and backed up a recent Commission, a European Commission um, a policy uh, initiative on innovation policy. I'm sure that the data of the report can be useful for all of you uh, in uh, developing uh, frameworks to invest better in science, research and innovation. I wish you a, a productive afternoon uh, and launch event. Uh, there will be uh, many um, uh, key analysts which will share their insights. And um, I hope with that you will indeed take ownership and use the report fully. Thank you very much. Many thanks, uh, Jean-Éric, for your very inspiring uh, words uh, and for already giving us a snapshot uh, on the content of the, of the report. Uh, so we have a program today until five o'clock. Um, so uh, after uh, uh, the so the, the next on the program is a presentation by our chief economist Alexander Hopsa, who will give uh, a presentation on the on the on the highlights of the of the of the SRIP uh, 2020 uh, uh, 2022 report. 
Um, after that, we have uh, a panel discussion which is uh, guided by Julien uh, 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 Guerrier. He is the director of the Common Policy uh, uh, Center. And uh, we have uh, an excellent uh, lineup of, uh, of uh, speakers. So please uh, stay tuned uh, with us to follow this very interesting uh, discussion. Also, in the meantime, if you have any questions for, uh, for the panelists, please do not hesitate uh, to use the Slido uh, and to use the, 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 the uh, so you go to Slido and then use the hashtag um, SRIP report 2022. And, and here you can put all your questions. Uh, so um, now I give uh, the, the floor to, uh, to our, our chief economist, Alexander Hobson. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure today to present you the main messages from our SRIP 2022 report. As Jean-Éric before mentioned, this is a major analytical and co-creation exercise where we had over 110 colleagues from different departments in the European Commission, but also for external top academics of international organizations who all contributed to this great report. <clears throat> I will have only limited time today, so I will focus on the main aspects of the report, but, but obviously you're more than welcome to, uh, to consult the report on, on, on our website and, and, and read in more detail. So the focus of our report is to look at how RNI and RNI policies can help build inclusive, sustainable, competitive and resilient Europe. When we, straft, uh, when we started drafting this report, uh, this was in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis. So the main focus of our work, uh, we plan to, to, to put on uh, the recovery from the, from the uh, pandemic and also how Europe can deal with uh, the long run challenges that we are facing, uh, be it climate change, uh, environmental, loss of diversity, aging populations, but also secular decline in productivity growth and increasing inequalities. Uh, however, shortly before finalizing the report, uh, the aggression of Russia against Ukraine took place, which obviously changed the context very importantly and then we had to embed this in, in our analysis. The overall thrust stays the same. We need to address the long-run challenges. This is, this is clearly an imperative. Uh, however, if we have to make sure that, that the short-run priorities and, and, and challenges in, in, in the uh, shape also of, uh, of, of the invasion are somehow reflected in our thinking. Uh, we also had to put a lot of emphasis now on, on the changing environment, the uncertain times that we live uh, now in. Because we have lived through a number of, of major crises, starting with a big financial crisis, with, with COVID, Ukraine, uh, and new crises in, in, in the future are likely to come. So this is also which, which has been for somehow embedded in, in the title of, of our report, uh, which is Building Sustainable Future in Uncertain Times. Now, <clears throat> we have produced an analytical report, uh, but for policy uses. So we, we transformed the analysis into, into six main messages on how research and innovation uh, can help in, this, uh, in these uncertain times. So uh, we are arguing that RNI can help us build forward better in, in the post-pandemic world. Here we we're building a narrative of a high-level group of experts, uh, ESIR, which is advising the European Commission, uh, which uh, formulated this narrative on, on building forward better which stands in contrast with, uh, with, with the building back better uh, narrative that has been around uh, before. Because we want to make the point that in the future we have to do things differently than we were doing them uh, so far. In particular, if we want to transform our economies and, and address the, the huge issue of, of climate change. Uh, we also for <clears throat> believe that RNI can be for a key component in helping Europe to gain or regain competitiveness, in particular, in, in current times, which are characterized also by, by the challenge of, of digitalizing the economy. Uh, I've already referred to the new element, which is related to, to crisis, which we're now living, but also the future crisis, which will come back. And for this, we need to learn to think the unthinkable and also be ready for that. And how to make best out of RNI to address these challenges? Well, on the one hand, we need to leverage businesses, institutions and people. That means investing and valorizing on these investments. Uh, we also need to connect actors, which we have in, in, in the system, uh, and also address the existing disparities, which, as I will also argue, are, are quite large in, in, in Europe. And finally, we need to ensure RNI-friendly conditions, in, uh, which, which allow 
innovations to be created, but also to be diffused across the economy. So let me now focus on, on, on these six main messages and then develop a little bit uh, further. <clears throat> so effectively, addressing the climate change and environmental crisis is the defining challenge of our uh, generation. Uh, and R and I can play a very important role in, in this. Here in this picture, uh, you see a positive message that actually uh, a number of countries over the past decades have managed to disentangle economic growth and CO2 emissions. So we can do that, although uh, investments in, in, in R and I or more generally in, in decarbonizing the economy are not as high as, as uh, we would need in order to meet the challenge and then to meet the objective of uh, zero uh, carbon in 2050. Mentioned, RNI policies can play an important role and they also provide an opportunity for Europe in this, uh, in this respect. So here in this graph you can see uh, how Europe is, is doing in terms of producing patents to address some of the grand societal challenges. And the message is, is uh, moderately positive here. Uh, Europe uh, is, is the top worldwide patent applicant in, in the fields of, of climate, environment, energy and transport. But also in, in terms of other challenges, Europe is, is knowing, not doing that bad. For example, food and, and bioeconomy. Also in, in health, uh, although we are lagging behind uh, the US, uh, the performance of, of Europe is, uh, is, is quite good and, and has improved substantially for, throughout the COVID-19 crisis. Now, on the less positive side, uh, all, all these developments are dominated by, by the huge rise in China. So Europe has been losing quite significantly in the overall worldwide shares in, in, in patents. But this, this trend also f applies to the US, uh, which in some uh, instances was losing even more than Europe. Uh, investing in R&I, uh, and in particular for those areas which uh, are related to the climate uh, crisis, also secure, clean and efficient energy is, is very important. On the one hand, I've mentioned this uh, is uh, key uh, in order to fight the climate change. On the other hand, now in, in the conditions of uh, you know, dependency on, on, on Russia and, and our policy efforts uh, to make Europe more independent, uh, it is important to also move in this direction. Uh, however, uh, what we have uh, noted is that investments and, and also the result, resulting patent uh, activity, uh, in particular as regards uh, clean and efficient energy, uh, started declining uh, in, in, in the first half of, of, of 2010s. Uh, you know, this, this trend uh, has been well documented also in our report. We will provide uh, more analysis on, on what might be driving it. Uh, since then, we have seen some uh, reversal, uh, although uh, there is clearly a need to, to compensate for this uh, slowdown. <clears throat> EU is, is also doing a lot to uh, contribute to these efforts. Uh, in, in, in this uh, graph you see a little accounting exercise which we did uh, to see uh, how much uh, finances going from, from Horizon Europe and, and other EU programs have contributed to research in, in the field of, of climate change. So when you look at uh, the renowned IPCC reports, which are assessing uh, the, the impact of, of, of climate change, uh, full 12% of, of them uh, have been partially or fully financed from uh, the EU sources. But uh, also more broadly, uh, in response to uh, the COVID-19 pandemics and, and, and the related uh, economic crisis, uh, the EU has put in place uh, its, its uh, next generation EU program. Uh, with uh, its recovery and resilience facility at its core, which uh, is uh, to provide almost 700 billion euros in terms of, of grants or loans to uh, member states uh, to help them fight with the, uh, with the implications of the crisis. Clearly, RNI plays a very important role in, 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 these, uh, in these plans. And actually, if, uh, member states are planning to devote uh, around 45 billion euros from this overall envelope uh, for RNI purposes. Uh, this, uh, this share in, in the overall national allocations varies between around 4 to 10 percent, uh, but in some cases this, this is a very important share and uh, if well implemented, the reforms and investments uh, will uh, change and improve RNI uh, systems in, in some of these countries uh, quite significantly. 
Now, uh, let me come to the second uh, aspect, and that relates to competitiveness. <clears throat> A very important uh, element how to boost competitiveness is uh, productivity. Uh, from this graph, you can see that the productivity uh, is driven by a number of factors, but the most important one is, is uh, human capital. Other factors which, which play important role is, uh, of course, r and is uh, investments in ICT, uh, but also investments in, in uh, physical capital <clears throat> and, and other aspects like uh, credit access, uh, market concentration, allocative efficiency, and so on and so forth. Uh, so when turning to human capital, for, of course, here one, one needs to consider this uh, more broadly, uh, for, you know, equipment of, of work uh, workforce with, with the right skills. Uh, <clears throat> but in this uh, graph specifically, for, uh, you can see uh, how Europe has been doing in terms of, of researchers. Uh, so in terms of researchers per, per one million inhabitants, uh, Europe has increased quite substantially uh, between 2000 and 2019, and, and we stay more or less at par with, with a number of, of our main uh, competitors. What is also important in terms of uh, production of, of science is, is, is being open and sharing the knowledge. And, and here if, uh, you can see that almost 40% of EU publications are freely available for under at least one open access publishing pathways. Uh, this is uh, around the same level as, as the US, uh, but uh, you know, almost twice as much uh, compared to China. Uh, a very important element of stimulating uh, competitiveness is, uh, and innovation is to have a dynamic uh, business landscape. So in, in, in this uh, direction, uh, you know, we've been looking at the situation of, of, of startups and scale-ups uh, because they, they play a very important role in fostering innovation, but also in terms of addressing challenges of the twin transitions. I mean, dynamic uh, startups, they, they have uh, potential to introduce disruptive innovations to come with, with game changes, uh, improvements, uh, which, which then create economic opportunities and also jobs. Uh, Unfortunately, the situation for Europe is, is not that uh, positive. We lag behind, uh, for example, uh, in terms of uh, startup ecosystems. While in Europe, uh, there is some 20% of, of, of these startup uh, ecosystems, uh, Asia is hosting 27% and, and America is, is hosting uh, 50%. Uh, so that's the level. In terms of changes, we are doing uh, better, and, and this is what you can see in, in, uh, in my graph, where there is a share of emerging startup ecosystems, so those which are being uh, created. And, and there, Europe is, uh, is recording quite dynamic uh, evolution compared to other parts of, of, of the world. So, so this, is, uh, this is positive news. Uh, however, challenges remain. They also relate to uh, the issue of, of scale-ups, which is, which is perhaps the main uh, issue uh, related to uh, the innovation policy problems in, in, in Europe uh, and also for availability of capital for firms to, to, to scale up. And uh, it's no mistake that, that this is one of the key priorities of the new innovation agenda which was published by the Commission last week. Uh, it is also for important to consider how Europe is uh, doing or how it's prepared to uh, embark the digital transformation and transition. So we need uh, a number of, uh, you know, we need skills, we need skilled population. So there we can see that, that uh, you know, the share of uh, digital skills, both basic but also above basic, is increasing in Europe and accounts now for around for 56% of the EU population. Uh, however, the number is, is still not as high as, as in, uh, in, in some other uh, countries. Uh, also, it's positive to see that, that, that firms are investing in, in ICT for skills of their employees. Uh, so over 20% of, of European firms is investing in, uh, in, in such skills, which is an increase uh, you know, of, of some five uh, percentage points compared to uh, 2012. And also there is a dynamic growth uh, in the share of ICT uh, graduates. So, so these, these are all positive developments, but still there, there remains some room for improvement. <clears throat> now, let me, let me turn to uh, the issue of thinking the unthinkable. And then here I show you uh, two uh, pictures of, of, of two animals, uh, which, which I like to call the zoology of, 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 of crisis. 
uh, I've, I've, I've mentioned. We're living in an unstable world in uncertain times, and it's uh, very likely that new crises will be coming our, uh, down our way in the future. These crises can be either unexpected, uh, and this is uh, something which the literature calls uh, black swans, so rare events with, with a very big impact, uh, which are very difficult or impossible to, to predict. Uh, or they can take form of uh, the grey rhinos. Uh, they, these are crises which, uh, about which we have some signals uh, beforehand, uh, so that gives us some time to, to act on, 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 uh, on them. If we don't uh, and the rhino starts uh, charging at, at us, uh, then it is very difficult to uh, stop. And in the past we, we saw, uh, we saw crises of, of both uh, types. With black swans, uh, it's quite difficult to, to prepare for them because they are unpredictable. But what one can do is, is to build some, some degrees of flexibility in, in the system. Uh, on the other hand, for grey rhinos, uh, we can prepare. And I would argue that, that many of the crises that we lived through uh, recently, in particular COVID, uh, belongs to this uh, category. Uh, means there were a number of researchers who were warning uh, about uh, possible pandemics uh, coming. So it is important to then act on these warnings and then equip ourselves, our systems, uh, with, the, with the right tools. In order to do it, we need to uh, you know, exercise uh, foresight, uh, we need to do, uh, you know, agree, increase the degree of uh, preparedness and, and, and response. Uh, in, in short, to frame more accurately what we know and, and, and emphasize long-run risk uh, assessments. Obviously, you know, thinking the unthinkable is not enough, but we have to also be ready to act on this. So this is this is appeal to policymakers to then incorporate uh, all this knowledge into into uh, the policies in the right way. And now, how to make best out of RNI? Uh, I've mentioned we need to invest and, and valorize. In terms of investments, <clears throat> there have been some improvements. So over the last decades, when uh, in uh, Barcelona uh, the 3% uh, uh, target for R&D spending has been, agree uh, has been agreed, uh, there has been some increase in, in, in Europe. Uh, but we still stay at 2.2%, uh, which is uh, quite far from, from the 3% target, and we're lagging behind uh, many of our uh, main competitors. Uh, a very important element uh, within the overall R&D spending is, is the spending by the business sector. And uh, here uh, we are lagging behind even more. And this is of course uh, an important uh, thing because uh, business R&D, it, it embeds uh, the investments which, which are more related to uh, marketability of, uh, of innovation. So overall we are spending less than, 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 than we should. If we take the 3% uh, target as, uh, as a benchmark, uh, there is a gap of uh, close to 100 billion euros per year uh, that, that Europe should spend more on, on R&D. Uh, this is to a large extent uh, driven by the sectoral composition of the European economy. So here in this graph you can see uh, how private uh, R&D decomposes into different sectors. And whereas in, in Europe, uh, less than 50% of, of EU corporate uh, R&D uh, expenditures is in uh, high intensity sectors, and by high intensity sectors I mean ICT services, ICT producing uh, health. Uh, in the US, uh, this is uh, at, uh, almost 80%. So for, you see, we, we concentrate our uh, activities in uh, sectors which are uh, less R&D intensive, and this also manifested uh, throughout the COVID-19 crisis. Because uh, there, after uh, many, many years, uh, overall R&D uh, expenditures in Europe have declined. And this was essentially driven by the decline in R&D spending in automotive and, and uh, uh, also for air sectors. Uh, of course, it's not enough to uh, just produce uh, knowledge and innovations. One needs to valorize on, on, on them. And here you can see that, that while Europe is, is doing uh, reasonably well in terms of researchers, as we have discussed just a couple of uh, minutes ago, also in terms of uh, production of uh, knowledge, also of, uh, cooperation between academia and, 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 and private sector, uh, we're doing much uh, less well in terms of translating uh, all this uh, knowledge into, into marketable solutions. Uh, which, which also then is, is reflected by a relatively low performance in terms of share of high-tech sectors and uh, overall the share of, of patents uh, of uh, high quality. 
So this is a very important element to, to act on to, to boost the performance of European uh, ECOF uh, innovation systems. <clears throat> Uh, another very important aspect in, in Europe is the need to connect actors and also address disparities. So here you can see if, uh, the R&D intensity in different regions in, in, in Europe and what, what immediately jumps up, out on you from this picture is, is, is the important divide between, uh, between countries and, and regions. I think from other publications, uh, in, in, in particular the, the European Innovation Scoreboard, we know that this innovation divide is, is, uh, affects many, many other areas uh, of, of innovation. Here you can see for specifically for the R&D intensity, uh, which, which shows a very important uh, regional pattern. Over time, unfortunately, we have not really seen uh, much convergence. In the regions which are doing well, they, they were doing even better. Uh, we saw some catching up in, in some regions, but, but overall uh, the divide is, is, is there and in some respects it is even uh, widening. One important aspect of it is the degree of cooperation. So here in, in this uh, graph you can see uh, the degree of inter intra-regional collaboration in, in patenting. So meaning researchers you know, in different locations cooperating on, on, on patents. Uh, you see almost uh, you know, around 75% of, of, of this co-patenting activity happens within the same region in, in Europe. Only a much smaller part uh, takes uh, across different regions of the same country and, and, and really a small part is, is uh, cooperation between regions placed in different EU countries. And this is a huge break for Europe uh, in, in developing its, its innovation uh, capacity and then stands in very stark contrast, for example, with the US where researchers cooperate more on the basis of, of, of their comparative advantage and knowledge specialization rather, f rather than, than in, in Europe where the geographical f location of, of researchers plays such an important role. Another key aspect is uh, the divide in, in the skills. So here just for f demonstration you can see uh, how different uh, populations, either uh, living in cities, in towns or suburbs, or in rural areas, how well they are equipped with digital skills. And again, here you can see very important differences between, uh, between these, these geographical locations, and which is, which is even, even more magnified when you look uh, across uh, different EU countries. So, so here we see a very important uh, kind of latent potential, or lost potential, if you will, uh, of, of, of skills uh, that could be better used for, for innovation in Europe. And my final point relates to uh, conditions for RNI. Uh, on the one hand, it relates to the right regulation. Uh, and regulation can be a powerful instrument to foster innovation in, in the EU. And uh, this is also why this is one of the, the main axes of the new innovation agenda, which, which uh, also focuses on, on aspects such as regulatory sandboxes and the ways how to improve uh, regulatory environment so that it is uh, well suitable for the new forms of uh, innovation. Uh, clearly, if, you know, the better if, uh, regulatory if, uh, quality we have, uh, the better for overall innovation performance. Uh, but regulation is, is not everything. And another aspect relates to the availability of uh, finances. So if, uh, here in, in Europe, uh, we have more or less seven times uh, less venture capital funding than, than for example, in, in the US. I've already discussed the issue of uh, startups, uh, scale-ups, uh, but also if, uh, we have the same problem in terms of unicorn companies. So these are young companies which, which manage to grow and then have market capitalization of over one billion dollars. Uh, whereas uh, Europe hosts 470 of them, uh, Europe only 69. And despite an, uh, fast growth in, in, in Europe, we're still uh, very far behind the US. So it is also important to, to look at these broader conditions for innovation, especially for access to, to capital. Uh, there, for Europe is, is engaging in a number of, of policy initiatives, uh, starting with, uh, with the uh, Capital Market Union, but also more targeted ones, uh, focusing on the help to specific uh, you know, sectors and, and types of companies. 
So let me finish here uh, with, with the overview of the, four, of the six main messages from, from our report. And as I've mentioned at the beginning, there is much more in, in the report. Uh, so I would be happy to invite you uh, to look at the report, uh, read, and if you have any questions, uh, by all means, please uh, get back to us and, and we'll be happy to engage in a conversation. Thank you very much. Many thanks, uh, Sasha, for this excellent uh, presentation. Many thanks for us uh, for, for sharing with us uh, the main uh, 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 topics of the of the report. I'm sure this sets an excellent uh, base for the panel uh, discussion, which we will start uh, very soon. Let me also remind you that you can ask your questions in Slido using indeed hashtag SRIP Report 2022. So please uh, put your questions in Slido and please also do not forget to add the name to which speaker you address uh, the question. Uh, before we turn to the, the panel discussion, uh, um, we want to show you a short video on the SRIP uh, report um, and we hope you will enjoy the video. We are living in a changing world. Stretched healthcare systems, shifting global geopolitics and climate change are among the many new realities impacting our lives. Research and innovation help us to understand the problems, what they mean for the planet and us, and to find solutions. For example, EU funding helped us to develop the COVID-19 vaccine in record time and is improving technology in our homes for a more sustainable, secure power supply. Science can help us build a sustainable, competitive and resilient Europe with policies that help us achieve green and digital economies for prosperous societies that leave no one behind. Prepare us for changes, both those on the horizon and the unexpected. With secure economies, diversified supply chains and knowledge that will help us to address future challenges. Invest more in people businesses and institutions to find solutions. Connect individuals and organizations to access and share skills and knowledge. And to reduce gaps between regions and countries for a stronger innovation system. Ensure the right institutional and financial framework conditions co-created with citizens to target priority areas. The science, research and innovation performance of the EU 2022 report guides policymakers and researchers through the shifting reality we are all experiencing. We need to act now. Find out how research and innovation can show the way to a better future for Europe. Well, good afternoon to all of you, and thanks a lot, Alexander, for these uh, introductory words. Uh, you have presented already some of the key messages of this uh, SRIP 2022 report. And as you've heard, the SRIP really helps us to understand the trends and dynamics in a number of topics that are key for research and innovation. I'm thinking in particular of sustainability, productivity, skills, geopolitics, investments, human capital, 
RNA output and framework conditions. We have quantitative and qualitative data and analysis that underpins the messages that are coming out of the SRIP, but it's first and foremost beyond an, analy an analytical report, a report that is aimed at helping policymakers to develop their initiatives. So in this policy panel, what we want to do is to explore with you some specific topics that come out of the SRIP and that are at the top of the policy agenda in the field of research and innovation. And we are very happy to be able to welcome on stage today a set of highly distinguished speakers who will highlight some of the most important messages of the SRIP report. We will have with you, in particular, Nuria Oliver, who is scientific director and one of the founders of the Elis Alicante Foundation. She's also chief scientific advisor at Vodafone, at the Vodafone Institute, chief data scientist at Datapop Alliance, and commissioner to the president of the Valencian government on artificial intelligence and data science against COVID-19. She's very well known for her work in computational models for human behaviors, human computer interaction, mobile computing, big data for social good. She is one of the main contributors to the SRIP report, and she uh, in particular helped us um, write a chapter on artificial intelligence for social good. We also have uh, one of our strong uh, supporters with Pierre-Alexandre Ballon, who is one of Europe's leading experts on complex systems, uh, the future of cities, artificial intelligence and blockchain technologies. Pierre-Alexandre is a professor at Utrecht University and previously had positions at the MIT and UCLA. He's also currently one of our high-level experts in the famous ASIA group, who advises the European Commission on RNI policy, in particular on the sustainability angle to RNI policy. Pierre-Alexandre wrote on his side a chapter in the SRIP report on spatial concentration of EU innovation in regional ecosystems. Then uh, we will have Francesco Manaresi, who is an economist in the Directorate for Science, Technology and Innovation at the OECD. He is team leader in the Productivity and Business Dynamics Unit within the Productivity, Innovation and Entrepreneurship Division. Most of um, his works are in, at the intersect uh, between finance and industrial organization. Francesco contributed to the SRIP report by writing a chapter on productivity in light of the COVID crisis. We will also have in our panel Andreas Teichkreba, who is a research assistant at the Center for Economic Performance at the London School of Economics. He's working with Professor John Van Renen, who is uh, uh, with him part of the program on innovation and diffusion. The current areas of research for uh, John and Andreas include applied microeconomics, productivity and innovation. And Andreas drafted, drafted for us, together with John, a chapter in the SRIP report on policy tools for RNI and their efficacy in the EU context. And finally, our last panelist will be Laurent Morin, who is head of uh, the Economic Studies Division in the Economics Department of the EIB. As you heard, the OECD and the EIB contributed a lot uh, to uh, working with us uh, for this SRIP report. Laurent coordinates analytical work on topics related to the financing of corporate investment, the analysis of microfinancial conditions, the evolution of the European financial system, the impact of regulatory changes and the contribution of the financial system to the greening of the European economy. So with these uh, panelists, I'm sure we are going to have an extremely rich and intense discussion on the outcome and main messages of the SRIP report. But before I go to the panel, I would like to 
remind you that you have the opportunity to ask questions all throughout the session with Slido, so I encourage you to connect, send your questions, like questions from others, and we will take the most popular questions at the end in the Q&A session. Now, let me come to uh, the, the panel, and let me start with you, Nouria. Uh, in your work, Nouria, you make the connection between artificial intelligence and sustainability. So what I, I would like to, to know is what you uh, think uh, I, uh, about artificial intelligence and other new technologies and, and whether they can be really the game changer to help us build a sustainable future. Could you uh, give us perhaps some examples of the most relevant areas where you think that artificial intelligence will actually be this game changer to build a, a sustainable future? And, and can you also comment on, on the fact that the positive link between digital and sustainable development is sometimes contested out there, as for uh, instance, uh, some digital applications are, are very energy intensive. So that's a, a lot of questions for you, Nouria. We are in your hands. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. And also congratulations on the publication of the SRIP 2022 uh, report. So yes, in, in my contribution, I, um, I definitely uh, advocate or discuss the huge potential that artificial intelligence has to help us achieve the 17 sustainable development goals. In fact, I would dare to say that we won't be able to achieve these goals without the help of AI, which is not the solution, but will definitely be part of the solution. And I say this because most of the goals involve modeling some underlying complex reality, um, which we can now capture using all sorts of different kinds of sensors, be it satellite data, be it mobile data, be it Internet of Things sensors that we put you know, on the environment, in our cities, in our um, energy systems, in our agricultural you know, um, a, a, uh, production uh, fields and so forth, and all that data, which is non-structured, this means is uh, images, is text, is audios, you know, is is uh, sensor data, um, needs to be analyzed and made sense of using artificial intelligence techniques. So, um, because artificial intelligence enables us to model, understand, and also predict what might be happening in the future in the world, it is a key um, technology, a key element in the solutions to tackle the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And then in the chapter, I give a somewhat comprehensive uh, um, explanation of such an intersection, but I just wanted to highlight um, some of these important uh, points of contact between AI and, and sustainable development. For example, in the context of uh, health, uh, SDG3 is, uh, aims to achieve good health and well-being for everyone on the planet. And the tremendous revolution that is happening right now um, in the healthcare sector is enabled by AI, because AI techniques allow us to discover and design effective treatments and vaccines. And we have seen this with COVID-19. They also enable to predict expected results and side effects of treatments and even um, infer the 3D structure of proteins, something that we thought was not achievable, you know, and not such a long time ago. The second area of impact of AI in the healthcare sector is in terms of assisting with clinical decision making and enabling uh, democratization of um, specialists. Uh, using AI techniques, we can support doctors in making diagnosis of, for example, cancer or tuberculosis or COVID-19 from radiology uh, uh, tests, some sort of like um, uh, radiological images, or we can predict the efficacy of treatments or the probability of needing intensive care, for example, for patients. And the third large area is the power of using AI to make better public health decisions. For example, in the context of a pandemic, but not only, also to tackle important challenges such as the mental health uh, challenges that we face. Um, and there are many examples that we can highlight. Another dimension on the context of health is the ability to 
achieve what is called precision medicine, so personalized, predictive, and uh, preventative uh, using AI uh, that analyzes all sorts of data, including human behavioral data, data from maybe wearables that we wear, together with maybe our uh, genome to um, uh, personalize treatments, but also to prevent uh, diseases before they occur. The second huge area of impact is the area of SDG 7 on affordable and clean energy. Uh, in fact, I don't think we are able to have efficient renewable energy, wind and solar, without the help of AI that enables us to make accurate predictions of the weather, you know, number of sun uh, hours or, you know, wind, intensity of the winds, uh, and also better predict the demand in many of the prosumer systems that we have where the consumers are also the producers of the energy. We cannot have smart grids without AI, otherwise they wouldn't be called smart. So to predict demand, to optimize the performance of the network, but also to automatically detect failures and cyber attacks to energy infrastructures. There are also robots uh, guided by AI algorithms that inspect energy plants. And there's even some emergent work on predicting the behavior of nuclear reactors and having more efficient nuclear energy. Another area of very important impact is SDG 13, which is climate action, which is very related to the energy uh, objective. But uh, thanks to data-driven AI models, we can model climate, we can model we the weather, we can detect patterns, we can make accurate predictions, we can build what is called uh, digital twins, and there are initiatives in Europe to build digital twins uh, of the entire planet, like the initiative from the European Space Agency, and also um, initiatives to build digital twins of different cities or even countries. We can predict global temperature changes. We can predict weather, rainfall. We can also better respond to extreme weather events. One of the consequences of climate change is the um, increase in intensity and frequency of extreme weather events and their impacts. And we can predict them and mitigate their negative impacts um, using artificial intelligence techniques. And there are examples of doing that in the case of wildfires or floodings or earthquakes. We can also use autonomous drones driven by AI algorithms and piloted by AI algorithms, for example, to monitor heat and prevent wildfires or to search for survivors when natural disasters have occurred. So this is just some examples of the very intensive uh, intersection and potential that artificial intelligence has to help us tackle the 17 sustainable development goals. However, as you very well said, artificial intelligence methods are not carbon neutral. The state-of-the-art models are actually very energy intensive. We are talking about very complex models that can have um, uh, billions, American billions, you know, of parameters uh, that require massive amounts of data and also massive amounts of computation to be able to learn um, something from the data. And that's why we do need to understand, measure, and mitigate the um, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions due to the use of AI to tackle, you know, all these um, um, challenges that I uh, previously described. So another an emergent area of work right now is the work of building more efficient artificial intelligence methods and systems that have a smaller carbon footprint. So the positive impact is significantly larger than uh, the negative impact of deploying such complex systems in the real world. That's extremely enlightening. Uh, your examples are, are crystal clear. Uh, obviously, um, there is a, a transformative impact of artificial intelligence um, and, and those new technologies. We need also to take into account uh, the research, uh, the, the energy intensiv intensivity of, um, of those uh, technologies. Uh, I am sure that uh, all of you now, if you haven't done it yet, want to jump into uh, the chapter written by Nuria on this uh, topic. So I will encourage you to do that, but not before you have listened to the other panelists. Uh, and in particular, the next one, Pierre-Alexandre Ballon. 
Pierre Alexandre. In your work, uh, you stress how much spatial concentration of technologies is increasing over time, uh, in particular due to increasing complexity and interconnectivity of our economic systems. So when you look at the distribution of RNI activities in Europe, uh, how do you evaluate them? How do you see them? Uh, are they optimally distributed uh, across the, the European space? And perhaps from a policy perspective, how would you balance the need on the one hand and our desire uh, to support state-of-the-art technologies in Europe? And on the other hand, uh, our willingness to promote technological diffusion across the, the continent. And what can be uh, the role of the EU in this? Pierre-Alexandre. Thank you so much, uh, Julien, for this uh, absolutely uh, excellent questions and, and not easy to answer to, uh, I must say. Uh, but before I jump into uh, my take on this uh, on these really important issues, I want to say uh, absolutely a big, big thank you uh, to the team uh, for this uh, for this uh, event today, for inviting us uh, to talk about uh, the, our our chapters. Uh, this is very much appreciated, and congratulations on the on the immense work that has been done, has been following. Uh, the making up of this uh, of this report for for some time now, uh, and I'm uh, as an academic, I am very happy to see uh, some of these key concepts around complex systems. We we're talking about black swan. We're talking about some interdependencies. Some very very difficult to understand concepts uh, being used at the highest level of policy making. Uh, I, I think there is no other way to do policy making today than just you know embracing the complexity of our world. Uh, and I think it's like it's, it's beautifully done in the in the report. So uh, congratulations uh, uh, on that. Um, as I said, your your questions are really spot on, and I must say uh, they really drive a huge community of economists, geographers, uh, innovation scholars. Uh, this is something we we, we think a lot, uh, you know, uh, these days because it's not it's not absolutely uh, it's not easy to uh, to to answer to. Uh, the the first thing I want I want to say to start. You know, thinking about about these issues um, is that in the chapter, what I show is that new technologies are extremely, extremely concentrated in space. And Noria was uh, mentioning the case of AI. And if we look at actually the geography of AI, which is one of the most advanced, uh, one of the most uh, transformative technologies in terms of business application, in terms of societal uh, change, uh, we can see that essentially the production of these key technologies is extremely concentrated in space. You have very few actors, very few regions in the world that drive uh, the production of, of these technologies, even though these technologies impact us all. So we have something like this new economic geography happening where the production uh, is extremely concentrated around new technologies but has a global impact, impact everyone uh, in the world. So it's a very uh, tricky, in a way, uh, and, and wicked problem because we have to, you know, be very careful about uh, the, the production side in that uh, in, in that respect. Now, what's very interesting is that the um, uh, the concentration of these new technologies, uh, especially for the most complex one. Indeed, it's something that is increasing. It's something that we document, and somehow I think there is another uh, chapter uh, in the in the strip that also documents something similar in terms also of productivity in the digital sector. So it's something that we see more and more. It's like this innovation gap is increasing. So uh, if anything, it's something we have to pay attention to. We have to uh, know this feature because very often, um, and I think one of the topic of today in this panel is to think about the policy implication. Very often and way too often, we think about innovation and the innovation divide by comparing countries. And that really masks the biggest issue and the biggest divide out there, which is between regions. So uh, since innovation is a regional phenomenon, it's not a country phenomenon. Actually, when we're looking at the R&D map and the publication map uh, earlier that was presented, you, you barely see boundaries in terms of countries. You don't see, you know, major uh, breaks between France, Spain and Germany, for instance. Now, what you see is a few regions within Spain, France, Germany uh, having a very, very high concentration of R&D, having a very high concentration of patents. Um, so the divide truly happens and unrevealed at uh, the regional level. So I think we really have to, to switch somehow our mindset and focus on regions and cities instead of focusing on countries and comparing countries. And that also links to uh, some policy implication in that case, 
which is if innovation is highly concentrated in regional ecosystem, that is what we have to leverage from a policy perspective. So to me, um, the biggest uh, Im implication here is that we need a very ambitious policy that will leverage knowledge in this ecosystem. And again, instead of thinking about having uh, policy also done at the, at the country level, uh, which is very detrimental whenever we, it comes about uh, it comes to innovation, especially for for some countries, we have to focus on the, on the regional level. So, let me first uh, mention the the, fir the the most important implication of of, of all of that in terms of policy. Uh, before I move to to one of the policy questions you mentioned, and it's that if we want to push sovereignty of the European Union, which is something that uh, Sasha mentioned. Uh, also something that Jean-Éric mentioned uh, in, in both in their introduction speech, uh, if technology called sovereignty truly matter at the scale of Europe, if that is a number one policy objective to make sure that we do have AI production, like worldwide capacity of AI production in Europe, but same for airplane, same for some key advanced technologies, nuclear technologies, green technologies, if we truly want this sovereignty, what we have to do is the very complex, we have to answer a very complex question, which is to bet on the right technologies and the right places at the same time. So we need to make very explicit this effort to prioritize technologies. And we're talking a lot about China and the US, and that is something that we see uh, in the economic plans in China, uh, the same in, in the US, we see through like executive orders, we see this effort at the scale of really large countries like China and the US of pre uh, making priorities around some key technologies, being the leader country in AI by 2030, the leader in renewable technologies by, 20, by 2045. Um, these goals are very explicit and they are all about betting on the right technologies. We cannot bet on innovation. We have to you know, bet on the right technologies with innovation, whether it's uh, related to digital transition or the green transition, we have to make priorities. So in a way, these 100 billions maybe that we miss every year, uh, you know, if, if we manage to, 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 to invest this amount of money, we cannot just spread it out around all kinds of innovation, all kinds of technologies. We have to bet on the most transformative one, on the one that matter in terms of sovereignty. But that's just the first part of the equation. That's already a hard one, a very hard one. You know, what do we prioritize? We see, you know, making a priority of the right technologies in terms of, uh, you know, energy related technologies has profound implication in the long run. So we have to make sure we make the right bets in terms of the right technologies. But then, and that's what this chapter is highlighting, we also have to bet on the right place. And in this case, the right place for nuclear technology might be a different place for, uh, might be different than the right place for wind technology and might be different than the right places for AI. So if you look across Europe, and that's what we show also in this chapter, uh, you see that depending on the technology that we care about, we have different places that have different strengths. So we need to have this knowledge. We, have, we need to have this mapping and use it to actually make, make the right investment. That's something we talk quite a lot about today as well, making the right investments. So at the end of the day, making the right investment means choosing the right technologies and really focusing on that, making big bets and betting on the right ecosystem that do have the capabilities to actually support the growth of these technologies. Otherwise, I mean, we're getting into a territory of wasted uh, public money. If we don't, you know, invest smartly in that case, and the smart investment is to have knowledge on where to where to bet. So the simultaneous, simultaneous bet on the right technology in the right place is really the cornerstone of uh, RNA policy nowadays, uh, according according to me. Uh, now, on your point as well on on, on whether there is an optimal uh, RNA, you know, location right now uh, in Europe. I would say that one of the biggest issue and challenge was actually shown by Sasha in his presentation uh, in one of the graphs showing the links, you know, how the share of patents that are, you know, between vendors from different regions, from different member states. And that's something we, we're working a lot with colleagues of uh, DGRTD here. And what we, you know, what we, we, we see is that uh, there is a very under 
optimal organization of the RNI system in Europe, meaning you know the top 10 collaborations of the regions of Paris are actually with other uh, French regions. And even though from a pure structural perspective, when you look at capabilities, when you look at specialization, when you look at scale, maybe the ideal uh, partners for Paris should be Munich, should be London, should be Budapest. But in reality, because our system is very, in a way, under, you know, non-optimal in that case, you see connections with places that have less to, you know, uh, contribute to each other in terms of NRI policy. And this is not something that you see, at least not at this scale, with the US and China. And of course, we know why. You know, we in Europe, we have a collection of countries. And this is our history. That's what, you know, these are the cards we, we, we have to deal with. But from a policy perspective, it literally means these are the system failures that we have to fight. So we have to, you know, address them, embrace them, realize they are there and realize this is like, you know, a stone we are dragging behind to make this uh, common uh, European area. But that really gives an immense support if we will ever need, you know, uh, good reason to have these investments at, at the European level, European airline investment. One of the biggest uh, reasons for that is that if you like countries, if you look at a um, uh, AI policy, for instance, you know, in different countries, and I know very well because I'm part of an AI institute that was uh, uh, funded by by President Macron to create this kind of AI strategy at national level. It's national level strategy. So every country in Europe has its own AI strategy, which creates you know a lot of silos of uh, teams that do not connect enough. And more than ever, we need at the European scale cross-country investment that's going to create this European area, a little bit the same that's what's happening with the Erasmus program, which you know I think is a fantastic program because it's creating Europeans, people that feel European more than um, uh, that, than thinking you know of themselves as French and, and Italian, but no, they think about themselves as European first. And we need more than ever massive RNA investments that are going to create and, and keep pushing and connecting this European space for innovation. Because otherwise, let's be completely clear, uh, there is no way we're going to, the gap we were talking about in digital space uh, between the US, Europe and, and China, it's a gap that we will not, we won't be able um, to, to contribute to decrease if we don't have a truly European strategy, a massive RNI strategy that connects this ecosystem. So that's another a, a system failure that exists and uh, that we absolutely uh, need to fix. So that's that's for like the first part of the answer. And I'm just going to conclude now uh, by the, the last part of your question that was really important, which was also about, you know, uh, somehow bridging the, this gap, uh, which very often is a um, uh, is in direct contradiction with the idea of concentrating resources to build sovereignty. OK, because if that means that we have to double down on the places that are already really strong, then the first question that people ask is, yeah, OK, but then you might magnify a divide that already exists. And uh, I think in, in some extent that might be true. Uh, I think it's a little bit tempered by the idea that you have different capabilities depending on different capability, uh, different technologies. So the, the right cap, the right places to bet if you focus on AI are different from the right places to bet if you focus on uh, aerospace or, or satellite technologies. So somehow there is a natural uh, redistribution if you do the right bet on the right technologies. So that's the first thing that we have to think about. But then even though uh, you might you might increase this kind of gap. Uh, I think it's a very fair point and, 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 and question. I think that is, you know, in a way, what we need to do is not to confuse RNI policy and RNI objective, you know, which number one might be sovereignty, and another type of policy, which is more like economic and social policy, that will be more redistributive. So if you have like more concentration over time happening, and you know, if AI production is not happening everywhere in Europe. That does not mean that we cannot build very strong social program in terms of education, in terms of uh, somehow redistribution of resources, you know, that can compensate from an economic and social perspective. Because what you don't want to do is, because in a way, the fact that the RNI gap somehow might be increasing might not be such a big problem. The big problem is we don't want 
socioeconomic standard to, you know, to, to diverge in Europe. That is a big problem. Now, the fact that you have, you know, the, 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 the movie industry is concentrated in Hollywood in itself might not be a big deal. What you don't want, you don't want all, you know, the economic externalities that come from the concentration of these uh, technologies to really transform uh, too much into uh, into socioeconomic uh, divide. So we want to preserve that. Um, but that's also, I think, why we have to, to also very well educate also our political leaders to fully understand the extent of this growing concentration of innovation activities. And that to me is also the best justification for redistribution of resources, uh, but more from like a, a socioeconomic uh, perspective. So very complex questions. Unfortunately, in like six, seven minutes, it's, it's hard to cover uh, this, this big debate, but I hope it, it contributes to, to, to think about this, these issues. So thanks a lot, uh, Pierre Alexandre. It was more than six or seven minutes, uh, but you, you, you raised a number of key questions. First, well, you identify the gaps between capitals and regions. Is it a bad thing or not? That's the first question to address. Um, to some extent, you've identified also this bias for intra member state cooperation between capitals and regions, but that could positively help those regions precisely to, to catch up. Um, then there is a need certainly to cooperate more between member states, and that's why we have Horizon Europe and all its predecessors focusing on collaborative research between uh, institutes and, and researchers and innovators from different countries in Europe. Uh, and, and then, yes, the question um, that can come next is, if we have a, a truly European ecosystem, will we then uh, uh, see even more concentration, but at a European scale with state-of-the-art uh, institutes and, and researchers concentrated in, in some geographical areas uh, and some member states then as a whole lagging behind, which would also be a, a political problem. So a lot of questions, uh, but that would uh, require a debate of more than six, seven or even 10 uh, or 12 minutes. Uh, so I will, I will stop here, but not without mentioning that on the 5th of July, the Commission has adopted a communication on innovation with the Innovation Agenda for the Union, uh, which is addressing a number of, um, of issues that you have mentioned, Pierre-Alexandre, like the, the innovation gap in, uh, in Europe. Now let me come to Francesco Manaresi. Francesco, uh, in your work, you show how the digital divide between more productive and less productive firms has increased over the years. And here there's a bit of a similar bind uh, as the one we discussed with, with Pierre-Alexandre. How can we, uh, at, at European level in particular, on the one hand push uh, the frontier to boost Europe's competitiveness and favor the most productive uh, firms, uh, and on the other hand, address this growing gap at the bottom of the distribution. And where does it come from, this growing gap? Uh, have you uh, analyzed uh, the, the reasons behind? Uh, and, and what are the policy implications for Europe to address that double objective, to boost our competitiveness as a whole, and at the same time, uh, to address the gap between the most productive and the less productive firms? Francesco, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Lili. Uh, I think it's uh, so to, to frame a little bit uh, uh, our analysis at OECD, the, the one which informs uh, the, the, our chapter, chapter 12, on uh, um, productivity uh, before and beyond COVID. Uh, we are actually mostly focusing on, so let's say that for us, the objective function of the policymaker is ultimately aggregate productivity growth and resilience, okay, at the same time. We know now resilience is super important. I would say that sovereignty, for instance, is more uh, potentially a, pro, a, a mean, but not necessarily uh, an object, okay? So when we look at the productivity growth in particular, and we see that uh, uh, it has been uh, uh, declining, I would say, over the period, we see that it has also been accompanied by uh, an increasing gap between uh, uh, most productive firms and less productive firms. Uh, this is this holds also within uh, sectors or within regions, and it's generally uh, driven uh, and can be associated, uh, empirically associated, uh, with the um, role of the digital transformation. So the, by the 
by digital transformation here, it's important. I'm not just talking about the simple adoption of uh, digital technologies, but also uh, the investments in uh, those intangible assets that are crucial to reap the benefits uh, of, uh, uh, of the digital technologies today. So intangible assets are, of course, uh, patents and R&D, but also other intangibles that are not measured by national accounts, but are crucial to uh, crucial complements to the in the digitalization process, such as organizational capital, knowledge, skills, and other types of uh, uh, assets, um, which become are becoming more and more important. However, the digital transformation itself and this reliance on this type of assets can explain the, the increasing divide. Why? Basically, because. Uh, of the characteristics of uh, these intangibles, for, for instance, by the uh, lack of uh, uh, pledgeability, which ultimately makes for a smaller and uh, uh, less productive firms harder to invest. And so there is an ingrowing problem of uh, the diffusion of the benefits of the digital technology, uh, the, the, the digital transmission over uh, the entire distribution of firms. While at the same time, we also observe uh, larger and more productive firms uh, being able to become uh, uh, even more productive over time. So with the emergence of what we call the superstar firms. Uh, now, this gap uh, is not necessarily bad per se, right? I mean, we're talking about firms, so I'm, I don't care whether there is more or less divergence among firms. It's not workers we are talking about. It's not equality. However, there are uh, evidence, and this is a part that, uh, of our, our ongoing research, which uh, we also discussed at the beginning of uh, our chapter, there is evidence that uh, growing up is also associated, can be associated with a slowdown in productivity growth. And the digital transformation in general can also be associated with other trends that predates COVID, but, can be, but that likely have been strengthened, strengthened by COVID and are worrisome per se such as uh, the increasing uh, uh, concentration at the level of industry uh, and uh, uh, growing concentration also measured through indicators such as uh, margin acquisition uh, activities. So this type of, uh, of, uh, mm, of, of issues actually call for policy interventions in order to somehow try to limit the negative aspects of the digital transformation while supporting you know, the growth potential of it, exactly as you were uh, saying in your question. So ultimately, uh, we know that uh, we, we, are, we need to look for differences and for channels that are behind what we measure, what the, the channels behind the increasing divergence and the slowdown in productivity growth. When we look at, uh, in particular, at what, at what drives uh, uh, the uh, increasing distance between uh, the least productive firms, the smaller and least productive firms, and the rest, we see that there is an issue of technology diffusion, which stems mostly from lack of skills, knowledge, and human capital among uh, uh, a vast part of the business sector. So in this case, policies should somehow aim at targeting these specific policy areas, so knowledge uh, and, uh, and, and skills and competencies, also organizational competence, on the side of the workers, but also on the side of the managers, in, also, in order to, um, to improve uh, the, the, uh, the ability of, uh, of them to participate in the digital, in the digital economy. Um, at the same time, of course, we need to we need to stick uh, to uh, fostering innovation, uh, which is a little bit uh, on the side of the upper divergence, the divergence between the most productive firms and the rest. This is not necessarily bad, as we said, but there are there are potential important issues related to competition or related to the ability of these superstar firms to uh, insulate. Uh, from uh, uh, the competi competitive forces stemming from uh, uh, new firms or other, uh, other less productive firms. Um, this relates to competition policies, but also relates to policies that would aim at uh, allow new firms to grow and thrive and be competitive against uh, these uh, superstar firms. And this again is about uh, letting uh, 
new firms uh, um, be able to access uh, uh, credit markets or capital markets better, developing uh, European level venture capitals in order for them to be uh, able to uh, not be skimmed away from competition uh, by, by this type of uh, large superstar incumbents. They are growing in its importance over time. So, I don't know if, uh, if I have a little bit of time, I can of course expand, but... Uh, no, no, uh, no, you, you, you caught up actually um, on the time used by Pierre-Alexandre, so that was a good, uh, a good duo, and thanks a lot for the, for the very clear uh, explanation, uh, and that's uh, indeed a, a sensitive and, um, and subtle uh, policy to, to put in place. Now let me turn to Andreas Teichgreber. Andreas, in your work, uh, you provide an assessment of the tools that policymakers have at their disposal to, to make the best of research and innovation. Uh, and in, in the current context of numerous crises and emergency actions that we took um, after COVID uh, and now the uh, invasion of Ukraine by, by Russia, uh, and on the other hand, the need to address more long-term priorities climate change, rising inequalities, declining productivity. How should Europe use those tools uh, in research and, and innovation policy? And in particular, what is the mix that uh, we need to, to have? Should we put more emphasis on some of the tools that have uh, bigger potential? Uh, and also beyond reinforcing R&I, how can we make sure that they are embedded in policies that go beyond research and innovation and that will together contribute to the green and digital transitions. So again, a lot of questions for you, Andreas. The floor is yours. You seem to be muted. Different crisis that we are facing. Um, and I should perhaps mention that we, uh, when we wrote the report, uh, the COVID was the most pressing, pressing issue. So the question we asked ourselves when writing our chapter of the report was how can the money from the Recovery and Resilience Fund and at the same time the increase in the budget of Horizon Europe be spent most efficiently. And definitely the increase in the budget of Horizon Europe and also the Recovery and Resilience Fund is a very good sign. But for us the motivation of writing our chapter was uh, definitely not only about like how much money you should spend, but also um, how the money should uh, how the money is spent, because these massive amounts of money should not only be used as a short term demand boost, that is what we argue, but rather as a long term investment that can help to restructure our uh, European economy and make it more resilient towards future challenges. So we focus on um, yeah a couple of different policies that by governments and uh, the EU that uh, yeah, can implement to foster research and innovation. And we make the broad distinction between two types of policies. On the one hand, we look at what we call demand side policies. So you can think of policies that incentivize firms to innovate. For example, subsidies through the tax code or grants to researchers. Um, and these policies are, are very good and I think are well known to, to many policymakers um, and very important to foster innovation. But as we argue, they are not everything um, because we also need this, what we call supply side solids, uh, policies. So these are on the other hand, um, because we need actually inventors who can perform the, the uh, innovations. So um, if you think about it, if you only increase the demand for research and development, by just having all these tax credits and giving grants to researchers, then um, if we, the, the supply of researchers or inventors, potential inventors is fixed, then this is very good for researchers or inventors because their wages will probably go up, but it's not good for firms who want to innovate because the research and development will become more, um, more expensive. So I think it is very important to note that really, as you said in, the, in, in your question, that we need a mix of different policies, obviously. We do not have the perfect mix of policies, but I think there's good evidence for using many of them. And let me perhaps start with a couple of, go through a couple of policies and also more to um, relating towards the recent uh, issues we are facing, how they can be used. 
I think very, very on the demand side to incentivize firms to innovate, uh, very effective are tax incentives. So the, the tax code generally treats R&D expenses more generously than standard capital. And uh, this is usually quite, quite effective. And I think we have seen a very positive development in many EU countries where these tax incentives have become larger since the financial crisis. There still is a large heterogeneity across countries, so I would say there still is some scope for improvement in some countries to increase these tax incentives um, to incentivize firms to innovate. Another demand side policy, which I think is uh, has a very uh, another very good advantage, are uh, research grants. So if you look at the flagship program Horizon Europe of the EU. Um, then this a lot of the money is given out in grants to researchers who can use it and apply for different projects. And I think if we compare this with, for example, the tax incentives I was just talking about, and this is very effective at targeting specific policies. So we were, I think, uh, the other speakers have spoken about this before, that we need to find those uh, innovations that are actually the most crucial and that can help um, tackle the most uh, challenging issues. If we think, for example, about climate change, then we can give out grants to those um, researchers that are doing research in the most promising areas. So this is much better than general tax incentives in, the, in a sense that we can actually really target um, specific policies, uh, specific innovations. And I think in a more recent context, you were also mentioning the invasion of Ukraine. Um, we see a lot of increases in military spending. And I think if this is definitely caused by a big threat uh, through Russia, but I think what we can do here if we use the spending correctly, this is actually also a big opportunity. Because if we use the military spending and in re research and development correctly, if we target through, for example, grants, um, those innovations that have the largest, uh, what we call spillovers, so the largest uh, so social benefits, um, so also innovations that do not only benefit the military, but also more society in general, then this can be very beneficial. For example, a uh, very important innovation from uh, military R&D was uh, the GPS system. So if you think about these innovations, then this is also a chance if you use uh, R&I policies correctly. So these are probably two very important of these demand side policies, what we call. Um, but if we go to the supply side, if we want to increase actually uh, the number of people who can potentially innovate, then I think the, the most important policy that we, uh, what we are talking about, there are a couple, but I will uh, focus on one here, is what we call finding the lost Marie Curies and lost Einsteins. Um, so children born in low income families, women and minorities are much less likely to become successful inventors. And this is obviously not about innate abilities. For example, from my, my co-author of the paper, John, um, he estimated based on US data that you could actually quadruple innovation rates if you removed these barriers to innovation. So there's a huge potential to actually increase the number of inventors if we remove all these um, different barriers for minorities and other groups. So, and there are different policies, I think, that can be used, for example, things like mentoring um, by exposing promising young talents from diverse backgrounds to successful inventors, for example, by female to female mentoring and creating different role models. Or even in a context of Erasmus Plus, um, you can use traineeships to expose young promising, promising talented um, inventors or promising talents uh, to expose them to inventors. So I think uh, to conclude, I, I just went through a couple of policies. There are obviously uh, some more, but I think the idea really is that a, a mix is needed and especially this intersection of what we call these demand side and these supply side policies that we on the one hand need to incentivize firms to innovate, but also need the people who can actually perform these innovations. And I think if these um, policies are used uh, together, then we are on a very uh, good path. Thanks a lot, Andreas. Uh, that's a, a very useful set of policy tools and instruments. And indeed, uh, we have to find the right mix uh, between demand side and, and supply side. 
and, and between uh, short-term and, and long-term impacts um, from, uh, from uh, these instruments. Uh, and I will uh, keep in mind uh, your well-thought uh, formula of uh, not missing out on uh, the future Marie Curie and um, Einstein of, uh, of Europe. Now, in, in the wake of this uh, debate and, and this question that you, uh, you discussed, Andreas, let me come to our last uh, intervenant today, Laurent Morin of the uh, OECD. In light of, of the recent developments that we've mentioned, uh, COVID-19 and, and the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine, um, how uh, do you see the key challenges uh, and the policy implications that we are facing to promote investment uh, where we need uh, to pursue the green and digital transition in the EU context. And there are the implications um, as regards the, the latest macroeconomic developments. Uh, we have now to face an inflationary pressure, uh, tightening uh, monetary policies, reappearing signs of financial market fragmentation. So what uh, have uh, those elements uh, in terms of implications uh, for corporate r and investment, in particular in relation to the twin transition. Laurent, yours. Thank, thanks, Julien. Thanks for your question and thanks for inviting me to the conference. Uh, let me start by congratulating the whole team for such an interesting report. We fully agree with the topics of the report and we also fully agree with the tone which, which aims at uh, guiding policy recommendation. So we agree with the contour of the report, uh, but still, since the report latest developments have brought new challenges, uh, these are the challenges you were referring to in your questions, Julien. So I will not cover all the report's topic, but I will structure my talk around two parts. Uh, the digital and digital innovation gap, which I will cover using statistics that we get from BIB investment survey. And then in the second part, I will go to the role of finance-based policies to support digitalization, especially in the current uh, challenging environment. So I start with the first part, which is about digitalization and uh, digitization innovation, innovation in digitalization. So COVID was supportive, but there, there are remaining gaps. And if anything, the gaps tend to increase between Europe and China and Europe and US. So first of all, we fully agree with one of the conclusions of the report that the COVID-19 crisis has accelerated the digital transformation of the EU economy. Uh, in fact, during the COVID-19 crisis, digitalization became, from a nice to have prior to the crisis, a must have during the crisis. We see it in the IBIS, which is the annual survey that we conduct uh, around 12,000 corporates. And we see that close to half of the corporates tell us that they responded to the pandemic by investing more in digitization, for example, by providing service online. And these firms, digital firms, were less likely than non-digital firms to see sales decline, significant sales decline during 2020 and 2021. So it's good to have digitalized more during the COVID-19 crisis. At the same time, the EU lags behind the US in terms of digitization. And for example, the share of firms using advanced digital technologies in the US is around two thirds, while it's around 60% in the European Union. So it's, it's slightly below, it's, it's significantly below. And on top, a significant share, around one quarter of the firms in, in the EU are neither category, no digital investment, no digital progress, no digital plan, while it's only less than 20% of the firm in the US. So there is a gap in digitization and also in innovation in digitization, uh, in the sense that the, the share of digital patents in the overall uh, pocket of patents is much is much below in the EU than in the US and China, and it's it's stuck, it's relatively constant. While over the last 10 years it has increased in the US and it has doubled over the last 20, 15 years in China. So this context has to be brought in comparison to the benefits that we clearly know and which are elaborated in the report of digitization and innovation. We know that it's welfare financing, growth financing, competitiveness financing. So these are good, uh, good, uh, good developments to have more dig digitalization and more innovation. So the question becomes how to support digitization and innovation in the European Union, given the, the existing gaps. And then I go to the second question, which is about the second part of my talk, which is about how to foster this. And being a banker working at the European Investment Bank, I will focus on finance. 
because indeed access to finance is clearly a hurdle given for this type of investment, given the very specific nature of this type of investment. In fact, in the EIBIS, the survey that we conduct, we get year after year the answer from the corporates that the message that access to finance when they do this type of investment is more challenging for them. It's more challenging for innovative firms, it's more challenging for young firms who, who, are, who tend to be one, the ones who innovate, and it's more challenging for those who invest in intangible investment. So we are very happy to see that there is a chapter dedicated to access to finance in the report, spotting the importance of equity and venture capital in order to foster this type of investment. And in fact, in the EIB group, we have dedicated specific instruments to close, to fill part of the gap in access to finance for EU innovative companies. One of them, a less traditional one, a very innovative one, is venture debt. So venture debt is a specific type of financial product which has some feature of equity, some feature of debt. Uh, it doesn't dilute power, it doesn't dilute uh, decisions. So companies, small companies which are afraid about that are very pleased with this product. At the same time, it covers some risk. So it's a risk taking product in the sense that it's, it can adjust the remuneration of, the, of, the, of the, the investment depending on the return of the investment. You can also have a grace period. So there is a lot of things which are in the setting of the product very prone to this type of investment, which are long term oriented and very risk, uh, risk, very full of risk. So when on the investing side, you need a product which is able to take some risk and to provide some flexibility. So this is there. This is good. What's going to happen? So in the latest developments with the rise in inflation, the war in Ukraine, possibly, most likely, if you believe in OECD, ECB, IMF forecast, are going to trigger a slowdown, at least, if not a recession, in the European economy. So this has happened in the past, and we know that in the, from the report that the share of innovation, the share of R&D investment, tends to be procyclical. So if anything, the slowdown in the economy should reduce, if you believe in one of the findings of the report, should reduce the capacity to invest in R&D. And this is relatively well known, and this is backed by historical development. What is very specific at the current juncture is that this slowdown in the economy may be accompanied by a tightening of monetary policy, which normally doesn't go this way. But given the, the very elevated level of inflation at the current juncture, monetary policy needs to engineer a slowdown in the economy, so needs to tighten monetary policy, even at the time of a slowdown in the economy. So access to finance is going to become even more difficult at a time when you need to support it. So there, it's, it's clearly sure that the type of investment that the promotional bank, EIB, National Promotional Bank, support is going to become even more important. The products that we deploy are going to become even more important. You will have less liquidity in, uh, in the financing of bank. You will have more in risk aversion in the market, given the elevated uncertainty. You may have financial fragmentation. We know that the ECB is working on that. So if anything, the context is going to become more challenging to finance this type of investment, which structurally are already very challenging to finance. And we are there to support this type of investment in this bad configuration. So let me conclude. Finance is not all, of course. We also need in parallel a regulatory overall. We need to speed up the market integration, the European market integration, to have corporates able to reap quicker return to scale and stronger return to scale. Finance is not all, but it's very key, especially at the current juncture. And if anything, we think that in the current environment, our product will even become more supportive. Thanks for listening. Julien, I give you back the floor. Well, for these uh, insights. Uh, we are working so closely with the OECD and the EIB that I mixed them up uh, and I wrongly attributed you uh, to, to the OECD. Uh, you're from the EIB, of course, uh, Laurent. Again, thanks from uh, my heart uh, to, to all of you for these uh, extremely interesting insights. And um, I'm sure that now everybody wants to read from A to Z the SRIP report uh, 2022. We are getting a lot of questions through Slido, so I will get to them in a minute. But before I do that, let me ask perhaps to all of you a, a horizontal question about resilience. Uh, we hear a lot about resilience these days, uh, the importance of it for European in society, society and economy is obvious. This is why resilience and preparedness to future crises is at the center of this year's SRIP report. What I would like uh, to, to ask you is 
how can we at uh, European level um, use RNI policies and what role can we give them to promote resilience at different levels, especially if we consider that resilience has a number of implications that cannot be addressed directly by companies themselves. There are sectoral issues like input shortages in some countries, risk of vulnerabilities and security considerations. So what role can RNI policy, in particular at EU level, uh, take on uh, to support our preparedness and our resilience for the future? One minute each. Is there a particular order or? Well, I mean, I think resilient communities are communities uh, that are prepared. So there is a clearly a direct impact if our um, and the policies focused on the preparedness towards uh, potential shocks that societies might face from health emergencies to economic crisis or social conflicts. Resilient societies are also societies that empower their people to respond and adapt to these shocks, that have economies that are able to react and self-organize, and that also um, are sustainable and carry activities without harming the environment. And in, this, in these dimensions, uh, R&D policies are critical. Um, you know, investing, and we've talked about this, in talent and in closing the gap that there exists right now in Europe in terms of talent and capacities is very important for the resilience of Europe and for empowering people to be able to respond to these kinds of shocks. Um, cooperating and connecting these uh, different ecosystems that we have is another way to be more resilient because you have redundancy in the system and there could be policies to encourage that. Um, innovation is a key driver for resilience because it results in economic diversification and economic diversification uh, leads to more resilient societies because you're more able to adapt to shocks. And then I've talked, uh, my chapter is all about um, having the low environmental impact and minimizing um, uh, the, um, the potential um, big challenges that we are facing because of um, uh, the, uh, the impact that we are having on the planet and also the different inequalities that we have. So um, the opportunities that we have in terms of investing in artificial intelligence uh, R&D initiatives that aim at um, better achieving and measuring the sustainable development goals are massive, and I provide recommendations in the chapter as well in that direction. So for me, resilience is the capacity to rebound. So I think it's linked to the capacity to, to reduce uncertainty. So policymakers have a lot of, of role to play in terms of reducing uncertainty for investors, innovators to be on the safe side when they implement their activity. Uh, then uh, a path has to be developed by policymakers to maintain this, to, to reduce uncertainty, to avoid fragmentation and to restore confidence. So uh, a common policy goal, the restatement of the commitment to support innovation, the avoiding the, the pro-cyclicality of government investment, so continuing to maintain support to innovation even in bad time. To guarantee this framework, which is relatively stable in, uh, in bad time, is very key for corporates to continue rebounding and for innovation to continue developing. So I think the macro and institutional framework is very core to that. To continue implementing the program which has been set up and giving the means for this program to expand further. Thank you, Laurent. Thanks a lot for that. Anyone else wants to intervene? Question uh, as well. Um, and I'm glad to see so many topics on resilience also in this uh, in this report. Uh, one thing I want to say, like uh, to, to start with, is that uh, when we have a more complex system, uh, a more interconnected system, a more globalized system, this kind of disruption by definition will happen more and more often. Like just the, if you have more interdependencies, that will pop up. You know, like this kind of this kind of issues and disruption. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing is. Um, I think it's also important to start building resilience in uh, the policy actions and not only the optimization process, because a lot of the 
uh, you know, like mistakes, especially that economists made over the past 30 years was to optimize, optimize, optimize. So just from like a cost perspective. And I think it's the opportunity uh, today, what, you know, the challenges that we face today are an opportunity to remember that we need to build indeed, uh, as Nuria said very well, diversity, redundancy, uh, economic diversification, and these things might not look good on the bottom line, also from a company, you know, for, for com company's perspective, but might be very important to uh, resist in the long run to this ki kind of um, uh, to this kind of, uh, of of crisis. So that's really important to to, to bring that back uh, as some kind of important KPI because we can measure that we can measure these indicators, and uh, you know they, they they might reveal important in the long run. Last thing, which is important also in terms from a complex term perspective, it's really, really hard to predict when this kind of disruptions will happen, but preparing might not be as hard. Just keeping in mind that, you know, this can happen. So let's build this redundancy, diversity. These are things that we can, we can do. These are things that we can measure. So let's focus on that as important KPIs. Sandra, anyone else before we go to the Slido questions? Francesco, I see that you, you want to intervene. If that's not the case, then let me go to the, the Slido questions because I see a lot of them. Um, and the, the first one would be for Nuria. What are you saying about, uh, what you are saying about um, artificial intelligence and health is perfectly true, says Fulvio. Uh, in particular as regards uh, epidemics forecast. So why were we so late and unprepared when it happened? I've actually written some policy papers about that, uh, if, the, uh, if the person is interested. Um, I think one of the challenges that we faced during the COVID-19 pandemic was um, the lack of uh, real digitization and a data-driven mindset in uh, most of the public administrations in most of the countries in the world. So to be able to um, really, uh, in real time, make informed data-driven decisions, in this case, uh, to support policymaking or measure the impact of policies during the pandemic, that will require having in place all the processes, systems, infrastructures, and capabilities to be able to do that. And the reality is that we didn't. Most of the uh, countries in the world didn't. So undergoing an accelerated digitization while you are dealing with a pandemic is probably, you know, is not gonna, uh, you can't really, um, uh, you, don't, you don't have the time to really do that. So I think that has been a very limiting factor. And I would say that one of the positive, in quotes, consequences of the pandemic has been the acceleration of the digitization of the public administrations. Most of the large companies in the world, in the Western world at least, had already undergone massive digital transformations and they had become data-driven organizations, but the governments and the public administrations hadn't. And I think the pandemic has served as a catalyzer to really accelerate that change. In the chapter, I provide uh, what, I, what I consider an inspirational example of the effort that uh, we did in the Valencian region of Spain, where for two years we were able to actually support the policy making uh, using data and AI, um, but it was just in one region of Spain, so it was sort of like a relatively, you know, um, a smaller scale, you know, um, dimension, which also emphasizes this importance of um, the value of regions within Europe and how developing potential regional ecosystems that are connected, it could, it could be very meaningful in the context of, the, uh, of Europe. But yeah, I think the key factor has been the lack of uh, the real digitization and capabilities and, and personnel, you know, uh, 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 civil servants and employees, you know, public employees with, uh, you know, data scientists and, you know, and with the right uh, uh, backgrounds to be able to, in a very systematic way, um, analyze valuable data to support and inform the policy making. Oh, yeah. The next question is for Pierre Alexandre, and you see it on the screen. What about the geographic, the, the geography of value chains? Uh, should we build EU-only value chains in high tech uh, through a physical colocation like the Silicon Valley? 
Yeah, this is uh, a, a very important uh, question as well. And uh, the answer here, it does not come from uh, an evaluation of uh, innovation capability themselves. The answer here uh, comes from exactly the, the, the issue of resilience. Uh, that we just discussed about and uh, you know like a good example is the eu chips act which i think you know today there is like an inauguration of a big factory in the in, in one of the french region um, and this is something extremely important to build resilience so i would say it is going to highly depend uh, on the strategic nature of the value chain and the the the, the, the part of, of the chain but i do believe that it's going to be an increasingly important question to decide which part of the value chain is to be uh, you know happening in europe exactly for the same reason that we discussed before which is to prepare for any kind of uh, uh, disruption uh, in in the, in the overall chain uh, 100% thank you um, thank you Ariel. Of course, there is a question of the optimization of the of the value chains and um, and the constraints that we have if we if we um, reshore that to to Europe um, in part or, or fully. The next question is for Laurent. You see it on the on the screen, uh, and it's about uh, capital for scaling up. Uh, is it really a matter of access or a matter of availability? Should we direct to European capital uh, or? accept to use more US and Chinese funds? First, there is a conjunctural aspect to the question, which is uh, the access, so the capacity to tap the funds given the market prices, stock prices, bond prices. But there is the most important part, is the structural impediment. You don't set up a financial system in, uh, in two months. So the structural features of the European financial system is that it's under integrated, that uh, big savers are not necessarily located at the same place as big investors, and that you may have the risk that you circumvent the, the bottleneck in the financial system, which is not enough integrated, going through China or US, especially US in this case. I tend to think that it's better to have innovators working in Europe with European capital as much as we can. There is the typical example of Spotify, who could not raise funds in Europe enough, so which went listed in the US. But then it becomes under US regulation. So it, I, again, I tend to I tend to think that it's better to have these companies working in Europe under European legislation than to have them leaving to the US. And for this, we must we must work further on the development of venture capital, venture debt. So some type of instruments which are underrepresented in the European financial system, as well as working on the integration of the proper European financial system. Merci beaucoup, Laurent. The next one is for Francesco. How would the increase in digitalization impact on job reallocation and, and how policies could intervene to mitigate that, uh, those possible frictions? So thanks a lot. That's, a, that's an important uh, implication. So uh, of the digital transformation, that in a sense it uh, it makes uh, uh, some works, uh, uh, some firms as well, um, to not able to, to 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 stay in the market. So in, in general, however, uh, I must say that uh, in most cases, so what we what we are observing so far is that uh, um, the main channel through which uh, uh, digitalization fosters okay, uh, um, a positive uh, alloc alloc efficiency in the allocation of uh, resources of workers across firms is not really through the reallocation, but mostly through the growth of uh, uh, existing larger firms becoming uh, more and more productive. Okay, because uh, the Covariance, okay, because the correlation between productivity and size tends to increase. This actually boosts uh, productivity growth, but this is not really employment reallocation. So there is the risk that there a larger share of workers that remain in less productive firms may not be easy to reallocate. Policies should work mostly on. Uh, uh, Again, keeping uh, um, labor uh, mobility relatively high, but at the same time allowing uh, the reskilling and the upskilling of workers in order to let them uh, be able to 
easily be reallocated across firms or at least to be used in tasks that are more and more digital and that entail uh, newer and uh, newer skills over time. It's, it's clearly a, a crucial challenge. It's something that uh, fosters not only welfare, but also, again, ag ag ultimately aggregate productivity growth. So there is no trade-off in this setting. We should work on, um, in this direction to, to, to get the best of uh, the digitalization process. Oh, and then the last question will be for Andreas. You see it now on the screen as well. The rise of spatial inequalities uh, has uh, led to higher discontent for those who feel uh, left behind. So what instruments uh, could ensure innovation benefit all? Uh, yes, I think that is a very important question. Um, if we look at, I think we, we saw it from other speakers, that we see the productivity growth. If we look at what innovations actually uh, lead to, they make some firms more productive than others. And there's a large um, gap between the productivity growth of different firms. And I think here it is to step a big bit uh, back from innovation. This uh, relates more, I think, to general economic policy that you need to make sure that actually when firms become more productive, you need the right policies in place that also wages of um, the, the workers and uh, uh, are a grow. Uh, for example, if you see that you don't see these inequalities coming up, um, so you can think of something like, uh, I think minimum wages are very important here, that if uh, firms become more productive through uh, new innovations, that also workers benefit also at the lower um, end of the uh, distribution, something like a minimum wages are, for example, uh, very, very important here, I think. Thank you, Andreas, and, and really thank you to the five of you uh, for very insightful and, and profound discussions today, very rich exchanges, and, uh, and, and also, of course, for your contributions to the SRIP report itself. As you've heard, um, all of those who are listening to us today, uh, this is really a report that is gathering evidence, quantitative, qualitative, but that is looking at them with a view to advise policymakers and to devise policy recommendations. Uh, we've heard today in the debate about policy tools, policy instruments, the right mix, uh, and that's a, a question, or those are questions that, um, that will be debated with policymakers. And, and how uh, to implement them in order to maximize the impact of research and innovation policies in, uh, in Europe. So I, I believe that uh, this event has demonstrated, if any one of us was ever doubting it, that we need ambitious research and innovation policies in Europe. They are the heart of our future capability and capacity to deliver on the green transition, on the digital transition, on our resilience and preparedness for future crises, on our competitiveness uh, for, for our economy. Uh, this is, uh, in particular in light of recent developments, a necessity that has become clear and that is consensual across Europe and, and policymakers. Uh, we need research and innovation to mitigate the impact of the recent crisis. We needed to address the long-term challenges and, and threats to our society and, and economy. And for all that, we need to have the proper analysis, the proper evidence, and that's what you find in the, in the SRIP report. Uh, this is going to support our reflection at European, but also national and regional level uh, for the future policies in the field of research and innovation, but also uh, in the areas of education, skills, or competition, for, for instance. What's important for us now is really to see how we can address um, those policies to fully benefit uh, from our research and innovation potential to ensure that people and citizens across Europe benefit uh, from its outcome. Uh, and um, uh, well, there are a lot of uh, challenges that, uh, that we are facing. We are still experiencing shortfalls in investments, difficult access to finance for innovative uh, communities in Europe, uh, innovative companies, differences in innovation capacity across firms, across regions. We've discussed that uh, with Laurent and Pierre-Alexandre. Uh, difficulties in attracting and retaining talents. 
so all of that will have to be looked at uh, and discussed um, within the Commission and with, uh, with the Member States to see how we can develop the appropriate uh, policies. The new innovation agenda I was mentioning in the, in the communication that was adopted by the Commission on the 5th of July is one part of uh, that um, reflection. Uh, it is based largely on the analytical foundation that um, uh, was developed um, uh, through the preparation of the SRIP report. So if I have one message uh, I want to pass in, in conclusion is that evidence really matters for research and innovation policy but for policy in general and the role of research and innovation to get that uh, evidence is absolutely crucial. So I will encourage you once again to read through the SRIP report, uh, to make your opinion and to see what are, if you are policymakers among, uh, among us, uh, what are the elements that you can take on board for the development of, uh, of your future policies. And for that, um, I, I invite you to look at uh, much beyond research and innovation. Uh, and this report uh, brings a, a uniquely comprehensive analysis on the recent uh, trends in Europe uh, and its performance in science, research and innovation, but also on its implications for broader policy um, uh, developments well beyond research and, um, and innovation. Um, what uh, I, I would like to, to say before I, I close down is, is also a word of thanks and gratitude uh, to a number of um, uh, partners that have worked very proactively with us uh, to develop this report. I mentioned already the OECD, the EIB, uh, but colleagues from the UNESCO and from the European Environment Agency in particular have also supported us in a very uh, uh, crucial way uh, with additional um, uh, academic experts also bringing uh, their contribution. So this report overall reflects contributions from over 110 enthusiastic, enthusiastic colleagues um, across Europe and beyond and I would like to thank all of them uh, today. Now it is up to us, policymakers, to tackle our challenges, to base ourselves on the report, to make sure that it is disseminated across Europe, to feed policy debates, not only at European level, but also nationally and regionally. And we want uh, to, to inspire the readers to reflect on what we could do and what should be our role in our respective domains uh, to develop future policy actions that will prepare Europe uh, for a better tomorrow. We hope uh, that uh, you were as enthusiastic as I am myself um, and, and that we were around the, the SRIP team with the chief economist uh, around these uh, discussions today and the contents of the report. And we are open to discuss that with you also on a bilateral basis. Should you want to contact us, don't hesitate after having uh, read the report. If you have any questions, comments or recommendations, that will be very warmly welcome on our side. Thanks a lot uh, for your attention. Many thanks, uh, Julien, and uh, also to all the speakers for the very rich uh, panel discussion, which I really think was truly excellent. So also many thanks to you, the audience, for your very good questions. Uh, this really helped to shape the, the debate. So indeed, as Julien has said, the report is available online. So please have a look at the report and please let us know should you have any further questions. So for now, many thanks for joining us on the launch of the SRIP 2022 report. I wish you an excellent summer and I hope to see you again in 2024 for the next SRIP report. Thank you very much. Goodbye.